Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present, to present my thesis. Uh, I'm Tulkana from Azerbaijan. Uh, so I'm working on Adama slavery, uh, especially the, as a region on uh, Crimean Khanate, slavery in the Crimean Khanate in the 18th century. Uh, my sources start from 1700, and I have uh, not finished all uh, to reading all the sources, but I have come to 1700 and 1705. Uh, so I will uh, today I will present uh, some of my findings. When I say slavery, I usually uh, mostly focus on non-elite slavery, uh, non-elite household slavery. Uh, this is the map of uh, Crimean Khanate. I'm sorry, it is in Russian, uh, but this. This green place is Crimean Khanate. I put the map to show, to have, to give some idea how uh, how they were getting the slaves, because they were getting slaves by kidnapping, by raiding to their neighboring areas, like uh, Ukraine, Russia, Circassians are here, no guys. Uh, so usually from their Poland. Upskirts, usually, usually from their uh, neighboring the neighborhood areas, they were doing the uh, they were doing their raids, uh, military raids, and were kidnapping people and enslaving them. So uh, and uh, as it is uh, because of its geographical location, they were usually. Uh, importing the, those slaves, uh, exporting those slaves to the Ottomans. Therefore, they were the main slave trade center for the Ottomans and they were main supplier uh, of slaves. So, <clears throat> studying slavery in the Ottoman Empire not only sheds light on the functioning of Ottoman society, but has implications for other parts of the Islamic world as well, including the Crimean Khanate, the center from which slave traders supplied the Ottoman empires. Captured in wars or kidnapped from non-Muslim frontiers, villages and sold in the slave markets in the big cities of the empire, thousands of slaves transited through Crimea every year, as long as the Khanate existed. In 1996, Halil Inalcik located a set of Crimean Kadı courts that they were 61 uh, court registers uh, found in Gasparalı Library in Crimea. Uh, he brought the copies of them to Bilkent University in Ankara, and then uh, some copies were brought to Islam Islam Araştırmalar Islamic uh, Research Center in Istanbul. That those 61 uh, court registers are the main sources of uh, studying slavery. Uh, these Kadı registers cover 130 years, starting from 1618 to 1750. Uh, there are only two PhD theses that have studied those Kadı registers. They, one of them is by Zeynep Özlem. She starts from 1648 and finishes 1699 when the Karlovitz Treaty uh, was signed between Russia and Ottomans. And the second one is by Frat Yash. Uh, he has studied by, uh, PhD thesis in 1650 and 1675. So uh, those Kadı registers have been studied starting from 1650s to 1700. Uh, after 1700, those Kadı registers, court registers, have not been studied. My thesis starts with 1700. So I continue uh, where they have studied until, and I continue from there. <coughs> So, until today, I have uh, read two uh, registers, two uh, court registers, that consist of 170 pages. And uh, in 170 pages, over 90 cases involving slaves have emerged. Uh, out of 90 uh, cases, I, will, I have selected the most interesting ones that I will present here today. One of the most interesting findings uh, concerns slave owners who vote to liber liberate their slaves if an expressly stated wish of theirs came true. For example, a woman, today uh, here I will uh, 
show, a woman made a vow, made a wish, uh, that she would manumit her slave if she bore a son, and that son uh, would uh, live until he could mount and dismount a horse without any outside aid. Uh, if this wish comes true, she will free manumit her slave. Uh, in fact, he, the boy reached that age, uh, but the owner of the slave doesn't um, make her promise, doesn't abide, and the slave takes her to the court, uh, saying that I am already free because my uh, owner made this wish, and the boy now you can see he can m m mount and dismount this horse without any aid, outside aid, so I am free. Give my freedom certificate that is called Utukname. And the, he wins the, she wins the case. Uh, she gets her freedom uh, and she wins the case. So here I have found two such cases that vote slaves, that their owners made a wish that their wish, if their wish come true, they would manumit their slaves. Uh, I have found two out of 90. Uh, and here I have, my goal is to question and to revise the level of property law, you know, which has been referred to the slaves for a long time in the historical research. Slaves have always been considered as the subjects to property law. However, the question rises, what kind of property? can sue their masters to the court and win over them. If they do so, which we can confirm from the court registers, then they must have had a special status rather than being only property, I mean in Islamic society. This paper is attempting to reveal such cases and revise their property, private property status. So 18th century uh, Crimean Canadian slavery studies, you see here a uh, kaffa. It was a city of slave market that uh, slaves were coming here and were imported to Ottoman Empire. Uh, slavery, studying slavery at a comparative social historical level, did not contribute to serious academic research until the establishment of Annal School. Starting from the 90s, 1930s and 1940s, Annal School, established by Marc Bouloch and Lucien Fever, presented a new insight and a new soul to the methodology of history discipline. Being different from pure empirical Rankian story historicism, which was defending the idea of writing history truths, historical truths as it is, Annal School started to deal with social and economic history for the first time, touched the lives of ordinary people. It was just that time, slavery studies started to draw attention of Ottoman historians, sociologists, and anthropologists as a new branch of the discipline of history in the 60s, 1960s and 70s. Nowadays, if we have few Ottoman historians such as Suraya Faruqi, Ehud Toledano, Alexander Vasilyevich, Natalia Krolikovska, Hakan Erdem, Hakan Kremle, Darius Kolozius, Oleg Brustamov, Ilya Zaitsev, from Russian scholarship, Ottoman, Turkish, uh, European, and American, that they study slavery, Crimean slavery in the Ottomans. But we have still untouched regions and untouched slave lives with primary sources in our hands that very few historians have attempted to study. Uh, from the very ancient uh, times, Crimea was always one of the most important trade centers with its strategic geographical location. A traveler, Edward Daniel Clark, in uh, 18th, 19th centuries, um, visited Crimea, and he was writing that for thousand years, Crimea has been under authority and protection of Greek colonies, later Byzantium Empire, Genova city-state, and eventually Ottoman Empire, and has always been trade center of them, because of its geographical location. 
Slave trade was actually one of the most revenue generating business among other goods during the Ottoman Empire. Crimean Tatars, being an important slave supplier for the Ottomans, were mostly kidnapping free non-Muslim people during their raids to their neighborhood villages such as today's Russia, Ukraine, Polish lands. Coming to an unknown world and culture, slaves' lives, identity, status were suddenly changing. Some of them were looking for the opportunities to escape, of course. Others were converting into Islam with the hope of getting their freedom, which was not guaranteed uh, to get manumission. So some uh, of them were enduring, some of them were giving up their lives. Frat Yasha has found some cases of slave suicides uh, recently, two years, three years ago. So slave suicides that some of them were making suicide to end their lives because their status suddenly changed, their lives they in a new uh, community, in a new society that they don't know the religion, the people, the language, uh, so, <clears throat> in order to show how Crimean Tatars deal with slavery, they, ha they even have developed special vocabulary for them. For example, for men, they use Kazakh, Gulam, Abd. We talked Ruk. Uh, I haven't added here, but they also use Ruk. Uh, then, for women, Maria, Jarie. Jewushka, which is a Russian word, and Devke. I think Dev I have uh, seen Devke and Jewushka. I think Devke is the uh, shortened version of Jewushka. It's coming from Russian. And for children slaves, they use Chora and Dogma. Uh, and Dogma in Turkish is uh, Dogmak, to be to be born. Uh, it comes from. So do they use Dogma for the children who were born in slave in Crimea, in slave society, as a slave children, they use dogma. These are my cut the court registers that I have dealing with the la in the last two years. Uh, these are the cover pages. Uh, as you see, these are uh, court registers uh, date back to the Ottoman. Uh, Ottoman years, but uh, in 19, in 1774, when the Russians occupy Crimea, they take all these cadre courts to Petersburg. Therefore, they have catalog cataloged in Russian, in Cyrillic alphabet. Uh, for example, here it says, "Askukas Shariyat Vasijiliyat Al Mariyat." Kırm Hanlı Hanlı'nın kadı asker defterleri. Kadı asker means uh, the kad, kadı court record registers of Crimean Canning. And here it says tarifleri, icri, hesapman miladi. Icri, uh, calendar and miladi calendar. And I have read, read 36 uh, defter and here 37 defter. Two defters. 170 pages and 90 slave cases have appeared from them. I put them as a sample to just give some idea how do they look like. It's not easy to decipher them. Uh, sometimes one page, for one page, we read in one week. And reading is not enough, you know. <laughs> reading is not enough because they don't put, then they don't use full stop. I mean, sometimes one sentence is starting here and finishing here. Uh, that there are a lot of names, a lot of cases, a lot of events. You read the chiffre, you transliterate everything, everything is clear, but still you don't understand what is happening there. Therefore, you make a mind map, a scheme that what is happening, who is who, you have to uh, put them and interpret them in a correct way. Uh, so, uh, we have read, we have 
finished two defters until today. My sources are not only those defters, uh, the, I mean registers. I use also Russian sources that I think they are very important for the Crimean Canate history and especially slavery history. Why? Because, you know, Crimean Canate was under Ottoman Empire and suddenly Ottoman Empire lose Crimea and Russia occupies there. And when, they, when Russia occupies, uh, Ottomans, Turks do not have time to take their uh, source archives, the bureaucracy papers, I mean. The registers, Russians, all of them are taken to Petersburg, uh, to National Museum, then Petersburg National Library, then they are archived. They are everywhere in Russia. You have to go everywhere. It's not only in one place. Uh, and the problem is that uh, Ottoman Turkish historians do not know them. Uh, they have to be found, enlisted, and they have to be uh, presented to Turkish hi Ottoman historians, European, American Ottoman historians. Why? Because Russians know them. I'm not the first person that will go there and will study that. I don't claim it. Russian scholars, Russian historians have studied them, but they are in Russia. They produce for themselves. They don't produce for Europe, unfortunately, for general. They don't produce in English. They are in Russian. Uh, they have their own market, own scholarship among them. Uh, that is the disadvantage uh, part, but uh, therefore, other outsider, European, American, Turkish historians do not know them, cannot read and understand, because I only know two Turkish Ottoman historians that they, they speak, they can read in Russian. So, uh, I will go over Gada. This is Rasisti Gaspar Svilni Arti Dream Akhtel, Russian State Archive of Ancient Acts. Here, uh, we have uh, correspondences between uh, Crimean Khans and Russian Chars and high officials. Uh, what is happening here in these letters, you know, as I said, they uh, kidnap people, they rape uh, to the Russian lands. The Russian people had long lived suffering from uh, such raids. And sometimes uh, they take ordinary villagers and sometimes they capture uh, high officials, uh, I mean commanders, high officials. Uh, so in this case, the ransom, for ransom, the paying ransom comes into the state. And the char uh, exchange letters between Khans, uh, Crimean Khans, to pay the ransom and to take that those high officials from captivity. Uh, so in the Alfred. It is Arte Vinishni Politike Rasiski Imperium, Archive, Archive of the Foreign Policy of the Russian Empire, and this archive is the uh, is in the MFA, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia, and there are treaties, again correspondences, agreements between Crimeans, Ottomans, uh, then Russians. Then we have for the Petersburg National Library and Petersburg National Museum, we have manuscripts there. Uh, like we found Neshri, you know, uh, we're talking Neshri's Jahan Numa, one copy is there. Then Petersburg National Library, we have Kaisunizade Remal Hojas. It has, in the world, it has only two copies. One is here, uh, dating back 16th century. One is here, and the second one is in uh, Paris library. Even in Turkey today, in Man Suleimania manuscripts, I, I went there to look for that book. It, it's not there. Two copies, one in Russia. Uh, then Yalta History and Literature Museum, we have one copy of Kadı Asker records. Uh, I forgot to say that in Halil Inalcik 61, I said that we have 61 court registers. There, Unfortunately, in my period, I am missing uh, several uh, defters. Like I have, I'm working on number 36 and 37. Uh, in 40, from 40, 41 to 45, I am missing four defters. So recently, uh, there is Oleg Rustamov in Crimea. He is a Crimean historian, Ukrainian Crimean historian. He told me that there is one copy in Yalta Museum. Maybe I 
I'm, I just hope that this is one of the missing defters that I, I have to go there and to see what number is this. Then we have Kaspersky Tatar Library in Simferopol, uh, previously Akmischik. Uh, there, those 61 copies that we are working on it, all of them are coming from there, Kaspersky uh, Library. And we have several, I didn't include here, we have several archives that uh, Ilya Zaitsev is a Russian uh, his, Crimean historian that he gave me his book uh, in Istanbul. And here I have found several archives about Crimeans um, in Krakow, in Warsaw, in Zagreb. There are correspondences in, in, between Khans, Mengligiray Khan, for example. Mengligiray Khan and uh, uh, and yeah, Lithuanian, I think, Lithuanian and Polish kings. Uh, there are agreements between them, and those uh, agreements are kept in Zagreb, Krakow, Warsaw archives that I didn't know them before. <clears throat> So these are our Russian sources. Uh, we have also bibliographies that Serkan Ajar has worked a bibliography, and Suraya Party has also worked bibliography for this center for Bonn, uh, slavery bibliography. And then we have primary sources, uh, actually primary sources dealing with Crimea, Muverichs, the history writers of Crimea, are nine. Uh, we have just nine manuscripts about Crimean uh, history. The, some of them is, I didn't include all of them, Imdötel Akbar, Assabuz Asseyar Fi Akbar, Mulukut Tatar, Tevarihi Desti Gupchak, then Tarihi Sahib Girayhan, I talked about it, I found it uh, in Petersburg Library and read all of it. Then uh, we have these are these four are only Crimean historians, but we have also Ottoman palace historians, for example, history writers that Hussein has a fan Fendi or Naima. They have uh, separate chapters about Crimea that we can extract information from them. For example, uh, I can talk about Kaysenize and Ramayhoja, what I have found, what I have confront, confronted there. Uh, for, especially I paid uh, attention to slave, this is slavery society, and he is writing in 16th century. He, he, he has finished the book in Sahib Giraishan period in 1568. Uh, and this is um, the most uh, important period for the slave trade. They go to, to Circassians to Moscow to Ukrainians to uh, to the military raids and they bring 30,000, 10,000, he, he writes, I don't know, maybe he exaggerates, 40,000. Once, once he rewrites that they went to the military raid to Circassians and brought 40,000 Circassian slaves. I'm not sure, maybe he exaggerates, it is too much. Uh, but I was especially paying attention that is it something abnormal that uh, he sees? Uh, is it something abnormal in the uh, Crimean uh, uh, society that they bring so much, so many slaves to the uh, to the to Crimea? But no, it's very normal because they make living with it. And he uses special sentences that leşkerin tümü doyum oldu köleye, meaning that everybody was uh, taking so many uh, slaves. And it was like a festive and joy if they took, if they uh, brought many slaves. And we have travelings dealing with that period. Uh, through history, especially for the period that we are interested, fortunately there are several travelogues that have visited Crimean Khanate and have given information in their travelogues. One of them is Evliya Çelebi. Uh, we don't know the exact date of his birth, but uh, approximately he died in 1685, yes, in uh, the end of 17th century. He has visited Crimea and we have uh, we have great knowledge, no great information about 
Crimean Caliph. Then we have Guillaume Levasseur de Beuclan, that he has uh, written description of Ukraine and description of Crimea book that was um, <clears throat> That was um, that dates back in 1651. Uh, and Baron de Tot, uh, we have a lot of travelers, but I have to be to make short. I have included only three. Uh, he traveled to Turkey as a representative of French embassy in 1755, and his duty was to learn Ottoman Turkish, analyze the empire situation, and get information about the Crimean Tatars. In 1785, his memories about the Turks and Tatars were published as a book uh, in Amsterdam. So, uh, this is the uh, bold case that I have found. It is a long case, as you see, and I have translated all of it to understand what is going on here. Um, for, unfortunately, the, in the end, the Jaria, uh, the concubine uh, woman, uh, the slave, wins the case, and it raises a lot of questions about the property, private property status of the slaves. So, <clears throat> As I said, there were a lot of ways after getting manumission, after getting enslaved, such as paying ransom, escaping if they could, converting into Islam, delivering their master's children, be becoming Ummi Velad. Uh, they were getting their freedom. <clears throat> So this case happening dates back in 1702. A female slave named Nasta, as we can see, Nasta is coming from Russian, Nastya, Anastasia. Uh, it can be a shortened version, Anastasia, Nastya. And it's saying that there that Rusil Asal, meaning non, uh, Russian origin, non-Muslim woman with medium size. Then they describe, the card describes his her physical appearance. Usually they do it. With medium-sized height, sheep eyed I don't know what what it looks like to be <laughs> to be sheep like koyun gözlü. <laughs> do you have an idea? Koyun gözlü. Maybe I, I think it's brown when they are brown eyed they call it, they call it sheep eye. Or when they have really really big eyes, they say koyun gözlü, sheep eyed. Um, medium sized high, flat nose, uh, these are her physical appearances, she used her female owner, Sahibe bint Mustafa, complaining that when her owner, Sahibe, gave birth to her son, Jan Timur, made a vow clearly stating that, but it should be verbally stated, not in heart, but <laughs> loudly, when her son, Jan Timur, could mount and dismount a horse without outside aid, she would manumit her slave Nasta. However, when Sahibi bint Mustafa's son, Jan Timur, grows up and uh, manages to mount and dismount a horse, uh, Sahibi denies to perform her vow and free Nasta. Nasta sues her owner in the Qadi court. Sahibi bin Mustafa is not present. She has sent her representative, is Inayet Shahmonla. So, uh, and Sahibe has reliable Muslim witnesses. Jumali and Ahmed bin Abdul Ghaffar Sufi confirm Nasta's claim when the Qada asks Nasta pre to present her evidence. As we understand, Nasta has got four witnesses overall. Two of them mentioned above say the fact that they have heard when Sahibe bin Mustafa loudly remarked of Nasta's being a free woman. Even they say that uh, we have heard that when she said, Nasta is a free woman. If they have heard and they say it in the court, it is confession. Like so, it is resulted in favor of Nasta. Um, and even they describe. That's why it is long. In the last part, they describe the situation. The Kada asks that, "How did you hear? How did you hear?" They 
describe the situation that when the soldiers wanted to take, when wanted, I don't know why they collect. They say that when the soldiers uh, led a campaign uh, to Magyars against Magyars, they collected slave women to take with them. And when the soldiers wanted to take Nasta, her owner came out and in the uh, around the neighbors she has loudly said that why are you taking nasta she is a, she's not a slave she's a free woman uh, and this situation describing this situation uh, is resulted is result in the favor of claimer in this case kadı makes a decision that upon sahibe bint mustafa's clear expression and the witnesses who have heard it nasta is free and should be given her freedom certificate which is called it and the second case it is a short case, but the context is approximately the same. They say, it says that Muslim Kazakh slave of Ukrainian origin named Devlet Geldi in Bahçesaray, is the capital of Crimean Khanate, again sued his master Ivaz bin Murad, claiming that his Ittıkname should be handed to him because he is a free man. But he has to uh, prove it. The reason behind this slave's claim is again his master's making a vow and clearly expressing that if his wish come true, he would manumit his slave devlet geldi. And the story is here, is that uh, the Iwaz bin Murad is the owner of the slave. He has a son who has been captured in the war. Uh, he's also enslaved somewhere in Christian lands. He's, it says, kafir elinde esir olan. We understand that it is in a non-Muslim uh, place, he's captured. And he makes a vow that if my son comes back home from captivity, I will release, I will manumit my uh, slave devlet geldi. And here, devlet geldi, the slave says that although uh, his son came from slavery, captivity, already for three years, he hasn't manumitted me. And he brings his uh, witnesses, two people, and they, when they witness that they have heard uh, Murad ibn uh, Ivaz uh, saying, making this vow, then he wins the slave, wins the case, and he's free. So, <clears throat> in these two cases, again the question rises uh, that what kind of private property slaves uh, can sue their masters in the court and they can win the case? <clears throat> they can come to, they come to the court only when they believe that they are free. And they usually come to the court to demand their freedom certificate, the Ittıkname. In the lack of witnesses or proper evidence, they are turned back to their owners. In all slave societies, life standards, treatments, and violence against slaves mostly depend on their owner's mercy and kindness. However, they are able to the court present their evidence and demand their right of freedom. <clears throat> that is to say, even they are considered to be property of their owners, according to the Islamic law, their rights of demanding their freedom in the court are reserved for them, and they use it effectively. All these facts allow us to come to conclusion that in the early 18th century, after the Karlovitz Treaty, slavery as an institution has started to decline, but has not stopped. Because in Karlovitz Treaty, uh, you know, uh, it is forbidden to Crimean Tatars to uh, launch military raids again, against Russia. And many historians think that there are no more slaves coming to the Crimean Khanate, but it is not true. Uh, because these lands are still uh, no man's lands. Uh, although there is threat between Ottomans and Russians, Tatars still kidnapping people from those places. 
So uh, it, these sources after 1700 should not be neglected because as we saw over 90 cases in two uh, defters have appeared. And um, as Goethe said that life is green, theory is gray. Uh, it means that um, in theory, yes, they are slaves, but in practice, they can go to the court, uh, they can sue their masters, and they can win their freedom. It means that in pr practice, there is something different there uh, in their private properties. Uh, label the uh, label that status that it should be revised very attentively. Okay, that was the things that I wanted to say. If you have questions, please. Thank you very much.